The Community Solution is an organization exploring the peak oil crisis. Its focus is on local community-based solutions that reflect the values of cooperation, conservation, and curtailment. The breakup of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s created a major economic crisis in Cuba known as the Special Period. So we have from 1989 to 1992, 93, a free fall of the economy to of 34% of GDP, gross domestic product. When I tell you free fall of the economy, trying to imagine an airplane suddenly lose their engines. It was really a crash. Cuba lost 80% of its export and import markets. Oil imports dropped by more than half. Buses stopped running, factories closed, electricity blackouts were common, and food was scarce. People almost starved. In reality, when this all began, it was a necessity. People had to start cultivating vegetables wherever they could. Over the next decade, Cuba took drastic steps to find solutions. It is the first country to face the crisis that we will all face the peak oil crisis. Two years ago, we learned about a concept called peak oil, in which we have, will find that oil production is sort of reaching a peak sometime in the next few years and will be going down, and that implies basically a major change in our way of life. And what we've discovered is that Cuba, because their own artificial peak oil was imposed on them when the Soviet Union collapsed is actually a model for what's going to take place in the rest of the world. So we wanted to see if we can capture what is it in the Cuban people and the Cuban culture that allowed to go, uh, go through this very difficult time without competing over scarce resources. And we think Cuba has a lot to show the world about how to deal with energy adversity which I think we'll all be facing. In 1949, oil geologist Dr. M. King Hubbard developed the theory of oil depletion, making the prediction that the fossil fuel era would be very short. In 1956, he forecasted that American oil production in the continental 48 states would reach peak production in 1970. Production did peak that year, as he predicted. In 1974, Hubbard testified to a Senate subcommittee warning of the dangers of declining fossil fuels in an exponential growth culture. The U.S. oil peak in 1970, combined with a crisis in the Middle East, led to severe oil shortages and an economic crisis in the country. Americans experienced record high interest rates, long gas lines, the highest gasoline prices in history, recession, and a declining stock market. Government films were produced explaining the problem. We were caught by surprise with a crisis that could recur and recur unless the entire country recognized the dangers of a quite real energy shortage. Our industrial progress and economic growth was fired by what many seemed to look on as endless energy. But warning signs were there. I think it's going to end with everybody changing their, their habits. During this time, gas purchases were restricted to every other day, long gas lines appeared, and the speed limit was lowered. President Carter formed a task force, which in 1980 published the Global 2000 Report to the President. The report pointed out that by the year 2000, half of all the oil available in the world would have been consumed. Carter had begun a new energy policy. Tax credits were offered for alternative energy, and wind turbines began to appear on the landscape. But then Alaska's Prudhoe Bay and the oil fields of the North Sea came online. The oil crisis eased and prices dropped. Carter's call for frugality and care was rejected. Ronald Reagan moved into the White House and dramatically cut research and development for alternative energy. 
It was morning in America again, and the country went to sleep for a generation. But the problem didn't go away, as oil consumption continued to increase year after year. In 1997, petroleum geologist Dr. Colin Campbell wrote The Coming Oil Crisis. Three years later, he founded the Association for the Study of Peak Oil, known as ASPO, and held the first meeting on peak oil in Sweden in 2002. Dr. Ken DeFay, a Princeton oil geologist, published Hubbard's Peak in 2001, followed two years later by Richard Heinberg's seminal work, The Party's Over. In 2005, Matt Simmons' book, Twilight in the Desert, challenged the stated oil reserves of Saudi Arabia. A flood of books and magazines began to appear on the market. 25 books were published in 2004 and 2005, and hundreds of articles in newspapers and magazines. The long sleep of the 80s and 90s is coming to an end. And with no more preparation than in 1970, global peak oil is arriving. Peak oil is the point in time when oil production reaches its maximum. And that doesn't mean that we're running out. What it means is that we're going to have a continuous decline in production from that point. Peak oil occurs when a reservoir is ab about half empty. Reservoir pressure drops to the halfway point, and so less and less oil will be extracted each year. World oil production grew slowly until the 1950s then accelerated until the late 1970s, dipped for a few years because of the Mideast crisis, and then began increasing again. In a few years, we'll hit the ultimate peak when half the world's oil will be gone. Oil production will begin to decline. At the same time, world oil demand will continue to grow, and world population is increasing along with it. What peaks is not total oil, it's the easy oil to produce. What's left is the less desirable oil that you couldn't get out in the first place very fast. It takes more energy to produce, and a far smaller quantity comes from each well. Oil is finite, natural gas is finite, coal, uranium, all these are finite fuels. So there's going to be a peak for all of these, and peak oil is just the beginning. The effect on our culture could be extreme. Our economy and our way of life are based on consuming oil and other fossil fuels. Each person in the U.S. consumes the yearly per capita equivalent of 10 barrels of oil for food, 9 barrels of oil for automobiles, and 7 barrels of oil for their homes. The major use of fossil fuels is for food production. What peak oil means is essentially a limited supply. World oil discovery peaked in the mid-1960s and has been declining ever since. Right now, we're consuming about five barrels of oil for every one that we discover. That is an unsustainable amount and can't be continued much longer. But at the same time, we have increasing demand throughout the world, especially in developing countries like China. Now, in 1993, China had 733,000 cars on the road, and by the start of 2004, they had 6 million cars. By the end of 2004, they had 8 million cars. They've convinced people that it's nice to drive. Well, the whole vision for these developing countries is that they're going to be like America someday, and that the people are going to be able to consume the way that Americans have consumed. But that's not going to be able to happen. And that's not even possible for America. Americans won't be able to consume like Americans today. Peak oil is unprecedented. We've never become dependent on fossil fuels before in human history, and we've never experienced a peak in fossil fuel production. So we, we're flying blind as, as a global community. And so we need examples. We need some sort of uh, laboratory experiment where we can run this and see you know, what's the best way to do it, what's, what's not so good, and so on. And Cuba provides us with that because Cuba has already undergone a kind of energy famine.
after the Soviet Union, oil import dropped from 13, 14 million tons a year to only four. Cuba in the 80s had 90,000 Russian tractors, factories of, of pesticides and chemical fertilizers you, we received from the Soviet Union. In 1990, everything changed. There was nothing. When the deep economic crisis began in the 19, early 1990s, it was a change in our lifestyle. We all of a sudden saw abruptly, in a matter of weeks, time, you know, a huge change. We saw uh, symptoms of malnutrition in children under five years of age. We saw pregnant women with anemia. We had underweight babies at birth. The impact on food scarcity was disastrous. The average Cuban lost 20 pounds by 1994. We were desperate for everything. We don't care about first world quality standards on any commodity. We just need food. It doesn't matter what you bring, we will buy it. Without imported fuel oil, it was impossible for Cuba to generate the electricity it needed, resulting in blackouts throughout the country. Well, we had, at that time, uh, power cuts that lasted for many, many hours, maybe up to 14, 16 hours a day. And this, in, in a climate such as ours, is very difficult because uh, you do need the fridge so the spool won't, won't uh, spoil. So you had to cook on a daily basis what, what you had to eat at that moment because you just couldn't put things away. And it was a very difficult moment. Power cuts were particularly hard in Cuba's large housing complexes. In a tropical climate, with its heat and humidity, it was difficult to be without the use of air conditioners and fans. Without elevators, people used the stairs. Water was carried up or hauled up the outside of the building using a pulley and rope. When taking a bus, people had to wait three to four hours. When the bus arrived at work, often there was no power. So even if they got to work and had electricity, there was nothing to do. After work, they'd have to wait another three to four hours for a bus, and often when the bus arrived, it was full and they'd have to wait for another one. The government imported 1.2 million bicycles from China and manufactured half a million more. We had to then uh, learn how to use bicycles, and bicycles were distributed all around the country to try to get to our workplaces. Doctors went to the hospitals, you know, on bikes without any culture of using bikes. It was just political will, that was it. There's no other way. In 1992, the United States tightened its embargo on Cuba. Any ship that docked in a Cuban port was denied access to the U.S. for six months afterwards. Almost overnight, $750 million worth of food and medical supplies to Cuba were halted. A few years later, the embargo was intensified and foreign businesses working in Cuba were barred from entering the U.S. Cuba's access to foreign capital was crippled. In the case of Cuba, you try to suffocate a country. You deprive the country of access to uh, financial sources, so Cuba cannot have access to the World Bank or to the IMF for good. An American dollar reached 150 pesos, and, and, and the average salary is, is like two pesos, no? there were people that were making two bucks a month. So money was not useful to, to get stuff. So we end up being like an experiment, no? like with control conditions, like nothing or very little things can get from the outside, so everything has to happen from the inside. During the first five years of the special period, government food rations kept the crisis at bay. These food distributions guaranteed a minimum level of food to each of Cuba's citizens. And it was invented when we lost diplomatic relations with the U.S., no more economic relations with the U.S., and in order to prevent hoarding, okay? So the more people have more money, we just swipe, we do away with everything on the counters, and others would go hungry. They invented this ration food distribution system. With food imports reduced by 80%, the government-supplied food distributions had to be cut drastically. You have the official state market through subsidies, ration card which has been shrink to perhaps one-fifth of consumption from almost 100%. Now, let's go to this board because I want to show you so you can understand. This is on a monthly basis. Anyone of the Cuban population has granted through this system 
three of four weeks of basic consumption according to United Nations minimum level of calories ingestion in a month. To complete the four weeks basic level, it could come in the form of subsidized food on your workplace, lower prices, so you pay meals at subsidized prices. So that allows you to pay only weekends or nights meals. So there might be a week okay, that you might have to buy extra, purchase extra. It depends also on your consuming habits. Every aspect of Cuban life was affected by the special period, but no change was as far-reaching as agriculture. Cuba had committed to the Green Revolution, a system which requires the massive use of fossil fuels in the form of natural gas-based fertilizers, oil-based pesticides, and diesel fuel for tractors and other farm machinery. The country's agriculture was more industrialized than any other Latin American country and exceeded the U.S. in its use of fertilizer. The Cuban agricultural conventional green revolution system never was able to feed the people. It had high yields, but it was not oriented to the plantation agriculture, open economy. We export citrus, tobacco, sugarcane, and we import uh, the basic things, 55% uh, of the rice, more than 50% of the vegetable oil, of the oil and the lard that we consume. So the system, even in the good times, how people here remember, uh, never fulfill the basic needs. Cuba's agriculture began to falter as one problem after another halted production. Fuel and parts for tractors were almost impossible to find. Seeds, tools, animal feed and vaccines were scarce. Esto trajo como consecuencia que, que la, 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 el de estar aquí era una, prácticamente una agricultura de supervivencia. Y los insumos que había de, de químicos ya no existían. Por ello que se dejó de la harina de trigo, los fertilizantes, los granos, el aceite. La, fue un golpe muy fuerte. Y muchas personas pensaban que el proceso podía colapsar en tres meses o seis meses. The lack of fuel uh, drove us to have a very cho big shortage of food. So people, they end up squatting places in the city and growing food there. Without knowing how, because there were engineers, there were doctors, there was not farmers. A drastic effort to convert every piece of arable land to organic agriculture was begun. During the special period, Cuba was able to help prevent famine through an urban agricultural movement. Every vacant lot in the city was turned into orchard. At first, urban gardening was an ad hoc local survival response to the crisis. They, they needed food, they didn't know how, and they just did it, trial and error. And there was some space, they have a problem with garbage, dumping, rats, so they fix all of those problems, uh, get rid of the garbage and start growing things there. Another thing during the special period was this identification of idle plots of land right, that were cleaned up by the community and turned into uh, agricultural gardens, urban agricultural gardens. Hearing of the crisis, Australian permaculture experts came to Cuba to assist in developing new ways to garden and raise food. So in October of 1993, the first two Australians came. And so we started to design the rooftop garden in that place. And after that, we got this uh, small project. For us, it was a lot of money, 26,000 America, American dollars. And we started to do a train-the-trainer course. They're one of the largest capacity centers for permaculture in Havana, and they themselves have trained over 400 people. Not only have, through these workshops and courses, have, has the community learned about permaculture, but they here in the center have learned a lot about the community. For example, if someone comes here and they have a health problem, uh, what they, can, they do whatever they can to help with that, but also they serve as kind of a reference point. They will go and look for the specialist and bring them here so it's a mutual relationship. 
the people cooperating with and caring about each other are the main factors that we need to encourage. We can all plant fruit trees, we can all have water catchment devices on our roofs. It's not the technology, it's the human relationships. The neighbors are starting to see the possibilities of what they can do in their spaces and they're starting to create uh, uh, natural gardens on their roofs and also in their patios. Cubans, who formerly lived on the equivalent of just two dollars a month, found new ways to supplement their income. These grapevines have a lot of uses. It provides shade, so you have a little patio area. You also can make wine out of the grapes and, and it's very good for the family economy because if you do it well you can get about 10 pesos for, um, for a bottle of wine. Cubans view of agriculture has changed dramatically. Farmers are now among the highest paid workers and people from all fields are attracted to the profession. I'm a musician, mechanic, oh, I'm mechanics. A mechanics, automobile mechanics, uh, I'm a designer of the electronics and nothing of this I am doing, Esto solo. No, only this. Only animals. Just animals and these plants. So he's an urban farmer on top of the, his house. The farmers in Cuba are not the poorest people in the society. On the contrary, they have food, so they don't have to spend their money on food and they sell food, so they make good living. No? So it is important to take it back in account. That is another way to dignify the people that grow food. With a very low cost, we were producing food, and now we have more than 1,000 kiosks allocated in the city that provide you with fresh fruits and vegetables produced in the neighborhood. More than 50% of the total vegetable needs of the Havana's population, 2.2 million, inhabitants is supplied by the urban agriculture. In small cities and towns, urban gardens are even more productive, providing 80 to 100 percent of the fruits and vegetables they need. Urban agriculture supplies food locally, eliminating much of the need for transporting food over long distances. The, the country has 169 municipalities. So five kilometers around the municipal towns also are considered urban agriculture. So it's a national system that is employing more than 140,000 people, actually. It's creating jobs. It's a growing sector of the economy. And it is very important. And we're very proud to say that. Cuba eliminated the need for natural gas-based fertilizers and oil-based pesticides by developing organic farming methods. Fortunately, research centers had begun studying sustainable agriculture before the crisis. Because of this preparation, the transition to an approach to farming that didn't depend on fossil fuels was implemented nationally within just a few years. Without fossil fuels, more manual labor was needed, making smaller farms necessary and increasing the number of farmers. One of the challenges, the peak oil challenges, is to reclaim land from the large-scale conventional agriculture. Un suelo en formarse tarda trata millones de años y en destruirse muy poco tiempo. Bueno, el problema, uno de los problemas que trae la tierra con con químico es la mineralización y la y la desaparición de la microflora y la microfauna. La desaparición de la microflora, de la vida del suelo. The soil is a, is, a, is a living being. And in the top soil, in the first three inches of soil, is the key. You add chemicals, you damage all of that. So then the soils became almost like sand. So we're going to be having interesting challenges and to uh, rehabilitate the, the soil. Cuba found that it took from three to five years to make the land fertile and productive again. Organic needs a transition, no? needs some time and needs some money to establish the system because when you get the soil, the soil is so damaged and dead that you need to, 
to rebuild the soil. You need to bring back the soil to life. And that takes time and a little bit of money as well. You have to follow the natural cycles. So you hire nature to work for you, not work against nature. To work against nature, you have to waste huge amounts of energy. Conventional people use this heavy machinery that compacts the soil, huge tractor, huge combined trucks and things like that. So you have to, to open the soil again, add more nutrients. The first ethic, to take care of the land, of the airs. This is very important. If we don't take care of the, of the airs, airs will take care of us and get rid of us. Entonces los institutos de investigación empezaron rápidamente a acomodar la agricultura a la agricultura orgánica, tanto desde el punto de vista de pesticidas como de nutrición. Para mí es más importante how the things that I'm eating are growing or are produced than what I'm eating. So if, you, if, if a vegan eats these heavily pesticide polluted vegetables, he's not doing much. Eh, el hecho de empezar a utilizar materia orgánica empieza que empiezan a aparecer microorganismos y paulatinamente se va aumentando de acuerdo a los niveles de, por supuesto, sistemáticamente, porque si lo dejas de hacer vuelve a lo mismo. Cuba's new agriculture uses a variety of soil enhancing alternatives to rebuild and maintain the soil. Crop rotation, composting, and green manure, which is a process of plowing young vegetation into the soil. Many tons of organic compost are produced, using kitchen scraps, rice hulls, and other organic matter. Worm humus is made in long troughs, where worms are fed organic waste products. This makes a richer fertilizer than regular compost. Today, 80% of Cuba's agricultural production is organic. The lack of fuel drove us to use less machinery, to go to smaller farms, to combine different crops in one small piece of land, preventing pets spreading. If you have one million plants of corn, you will have one million bucks that eats only corn, and you have a pest. We develop many biopesticides and many biofertilizers. Today we are even exporting to Central American countries and other Latin American countries we are exporting biopesticides and biofertilizers. Remember Cuba has one advantage. If the Cuba population of Cuba is 2% of the population in Latin America, Cuba has 11% of all the scientists in Latin America. It's difficult to grow certain crops in Cuba's heat so farmers use a variety of mesh covers to cut the sun's rays. We can extend the season and just using something as simple as putting uh, a fabric, a porous fabric over a simple structure that you can remove when a hurricane is coming and you can uh, build again. It's very simple and this fabric also allows you to control the pest because you not only reduce the radiation and the heat, but you also reduce the number of bugs entering into the area. In the 80s, in Cuba, we used 21,000 tons of pesticides, chemical pesticides. Now, it's 1,000. We are using 21 times less pesticides. This is good for the environment, this is good for the health, and this is also good for the soil. Cuba uses crop interplanting to reduce the need for pesticides and make their agriculture more sustainable. Nobody fertilizes a forest and nobody irrigates a forest. The forest do by itself. So if you are able to create like something like a food forest, your main effort is like pick the fruits and pick the products. And uh, so in that way, the effort is less. You work hard in the very beginning, but once the system is established, uh, you work a lot less. It's what we call lazy people agriculture, but it's because you are working with nature, not against nature. These people in the conventional system work against the nature. Arriba. One of the th good sides of the crisis was to go back to, to oxen, to use animals. Not only that they save fuel, they do, they do not compact the soil. 
the way the tractor does. They, they exert less pressure, and even the, the legs of the oxen remove the earth. Older farmers who still remembered how to grow and train oxen were set up in training schools. In a little over a year, most cooperatives had someone trained, and the process of raising thousands of oxen had begun. A pair of oxen is not the same as a tractor. A man can work eight hours in a tractor, he have conditioned air, and a CD player, but you cannot work for those hours because oxen just go in the floor, they say, that's it, you know? But you need also to train those people and train the oxen as well. So it was necessary a result of a change of mind, the change of scale, and it was a big effort, but how much money they save in fuel, how much money they save in, in parts, how much money they, say they save in tractors. But I should say, how much, mo how much money is the, the pollution of these tractors? It has to be analyzed from several approaches. They did it because they have to. But from a, a, a few years' point of view, there are many benefits. To increase food production, the government worked with farmers to find local solutions. The result was smaller farms and cooperatives with a high degree of privatization and autonomy. Forty percent of the large state farms were divided into privately owned cooperatives. Tens of thousands of acres of land were leased rent-free to small farmers. Decision-making was localized with fewer state regulations. Two requirements. You grow things there. You, if you don't grow things there, we take you the place from, away from you and give it to somebody else. And second, that the land is uh, delivered to you in usufruit. Usufruit is a, an old Roman word that means that you can use the land without paying taxes or without paying for it. But if it's, this land is needed for another purpose, for a man, it can be like you, you have to give it back to, to the government. These smaller farms and cooperatives were better able to use the new sustainable practices vital for growing food organically. 12 to 50 percent of the total arable land is in private hands in Cuba. So these are the, the private farmers. They are by far the highest production per acre and per person. In second places, it's like co-ops, cooperative. Uh, they are the second. And third is like the huge government states. These new private farms and co-ops also began to function in new ways. But we have credit and services co-ops. What does that mean? You don't want to join your lands with me? We don't. So we are together in the co-op for credits, to buy the seats together, to, to, to hire the machinery for this stuff. But we don't have to join their land. So it's a way of decentralized but centralized at, at the same time. Thousands of families moved to rural land. With land rights guaranteed, a sense of ownership led to greater productivity. Private farmers markets and new export markets led to greater production. The communities have changed. It's the local economy. People were exchanging things. Many of these gardens, they supply for free food to elder people's circles, daycare centers, uh, schools, working centers, pregnant women, uh, and they do it for free. And they don't do it because it's compulsory. They do it because they want it. They want to do their little part to, to the society. But in other places, people don't know their neighbors. They don't know their names. They don't say hello to each other. Here, no, the neighbor knocks the door and say, I need some salt, I need some sugar, whatever. I brought you an avocado, no? <laughs> and recover this, this sense of neighbor. It, it, for me, it's not going backwards. Without oil for transportation, Cuba's educational system was threatened. Decentralizing universities provided people with access to nearby schools for higher education and lessened the impact of fuel shortages. The example of the universities now that to put in every municipality also, because in my opinion, transportation and housing is right now the biggest problem in Cuba, because uh, this depends more on oil. 
This large building was the most exclusive school in Cuba, the Sacre Coeur, but today is the University of Medical Sciences. For your information, Cuba had three universities, but today has about 50, seven of them in Havana. Medical clinics and schools are available throughout Cuba. During the crisis, the Cuban government continued supplying its citizens with free health care and education. Very different from what happens uh, worldwide when there's an economic crisis. The first thing they do is cut down on social services. This was not the case. Doctors, nurses, and social workers live within the neighborhoods where they work, part of the social fabric of the community. Cuba's free medical care helped them in the crisis. In spite of the hardships, they maintained a lifespan and infant mortality rate roughly equal to that in the U.S. Even though the average Cuban consumes less than one-eighth the energy of the average American. Overall, the economic crisis improved Cubans' health. Increased walking and biking reduced diabetes and the number of heart attacks and strokes. The Cuban diet changed. Fat consumption was reduced, while more vegetables and a wider variety of vegetables were eaten. Cuba actually trains more doctors than they need and sends them to developing countries around the world. They also exchange doctors and medical expertise with Venezuela in return for oil. When I look at other countries, developed countries, everything goes around making the automobile more efficient. How much energy do you need to produce a car? You have to spend energy on producing a car and later you have to find the fuel to make the car move. So think about reducing the number of cars. During the worst of the crisis, there was very little fuel for cars. The freeway and country roads were almost empty. Cuba needed to develop a mass transit system overnight. With few resources, they had to be innovative. Old trucks were made into buses with canopies to keep off the rain and steps welded on the back. Another solution was the camel, a trailer pulled by a semi-tractor that can carry up to 300 people. In Havana and other provinces, carpooling and hitchhiking are common. Government cars are required to pick up anyone who needs a ride. The loss of fuel for transportation also affected small towns and cities. Their people turned to horses and mules for transportation. During the first years of the special period, bicycles were a necessity. This was not easy for Cubans who had been used to cars and buses. It requires more consciousness and more awareness about the uh, the use of the bicycle, that the bicycle is not uh, something that we have to use because we don't have fuel or we don't have buses in the city. The question is that the bicycle never contaminates, it's more healthy, and for short distances, it's very practical. But if you have to move 20 kilometers a day back and forth, 40 kilometers a day in a Chinese bicycle, no gears, all steel, after five years, you hate it. And that was what happened in Cuba. Like at some point when there are a little bit more camels or, and buses, people just quit because they were sick of it. One day people start thinking about the end of the car. There will be an era, a moment in the, the, the life. So one day the car appeared and one day the car will disappear. The car will be something that we will remember as a moment in the development of the mankind. Since the special period began, it's been difficult to build new housing because of a scarcity of tools and materials. Cement production requires a lot of fuel, and that's why the cement production has been reduced. Everyone in Cuba has a place to live, and 85% of the people own their own home. But most houses are small and simple with few amenities. In the countryside, that means a small house, with a living room, kitchen, 
and two or three bedrooms. Rural housing has the advantage of more open space, where people can grow vegetables and fruit and raise livestock. In Havana, if you don't live in one of the old single-family homes, it may mean living in a dilapidated building or with your relatives in a crowded apartment. Even so, the city is a place many people want to live. Havana already has the values that many urban planners and architects in the world would like to recover. Many people have come and said, you should preserve the city we want to recover. After the big sprawl, many people are looking back to the traditional city and looking the ways to live in the traditional city in a more human way. But living in a city without adequate transportation causes major difficulties. And the other problem here is that this is only housing and they have to go to the city. They have to come and go, they have to commute, and they have to spend time in looking for a transportation between the city and uh, their neighborhood. To reduce the long commutes, new mixed-use developments include schools, places to work, and places for recreation within walking and biking distance of people's homes. Everybody must use the same space. So design provides a common space for everybody. This is a way to keep your community alive. At the start of the special period, 95% of Cubans were connected to the national electric grid. The other 5% lived in remote areas. Photovoltaic and wind energy are too expensive to meet much of Cuba's energy needs. But for areas not connected to the grid, small-scale wind and hydro systems, as well as solar panels, are used. Priority is given to schools and clinics. Recently, more than 2,000 rural schools were supplied with solar panels to have electricity. It was less costly to give them the solar panels rather than to connect them to the grid. In Los Tumbos, solar panels power the school, clinic, community center, even people's homes. If they have their, the panels up, up on the roof and they're recharging the, the light battery right now, compact fluorescence, they can put this radio on. And this is another panel of her sons who lives right there. Small solutions have been developed throughout Cuba, such as using the sun to preheat water. People in, in Cuba used to shower with heat water. So they use co um, traditional oil or energy, whatever they have, to heat water. So if we can have solar heaters, it's better. But when you obtain the water from the solar heater, it is 60 degrees. You can save the half of the, um, the fuel you use to, to heat the water to boil. Before the crisis, Cuba relied on imported fuel oil to generate electricity. Without this, they had to modify their power plants to burn their poor quality domestic crude oil. Our crude oil is very... A bad, a bad thing for environment, but we had no choice. It's a matter of li live or die. They also began using crop waste to generate electricity. Sugar mills have been turned into power plants because you mill the sugar and then you have the bagasse. You burn the fibers, you produce heat, and then you produce electricity. So you can turn a sugar mill with, during the season or, or after the season into an, an additional power plant. And right now in Cuba, during the time of harvest, which is about three or four months during the year, 30% of the energy that's generated in Cuba comes from the renewable source of biomass. 
So this is what we call the energetic sovereignty. We do not depend on all imports to, do, to produce electricity. The problem is what the people said about Cuba in the States is not what we are doing here. Many people there think how they can survive if they don't have anything. Ah, okay, come here and you can see how we can survive. And in this way we can begin to understand each other and to know how to, to think. Mankind is burning in one century all the oil accumulated by nature during millions of years. And that is absurd, completely absurd. I don't see that countries who depend largely on imported oil are thinking about alternative sources of energy. They are just planning for the next week. If I'm in Cuba, I say, people, we have problems. We must turn off all the lights that we are not using. And everybody said, okay, we are going to turn off. But if I say in the United States, people, we must turn off all the lights because we need, everybody say, why, if I pay? The problem is we must change how we think. You know, the idea of peak oil is that things are going to change and there's going to be less. I think Cubans understand that on, on an international, global level because uh, island people have that innate sense of a limited resource. And also they realize in terms of energy, if they want to be politically independent, they had to be economically independent. To be economically independent, you have to be energy independent. Is oil going to last in the next 10 to 15 years? Who knows, maybe not. Maybe in Cuba we find uh, uh, an enormous uh, oil tank underground for 50 years more, or oh, wonderful. We have 50 years more, but the security of supply is getting more risky day by day. And there is also this hope to find in the deep waters of the Mexican Gulf good petrol. But people don't think about that as an asset. No, we're going to improve their life here. No, no, we're going to sell it, you know, because people know that we don't need that to live. You know what I mean? Okay, we need money to develop, but it's, it's, it's like an, something to sell, not something to use or to waste. The sun was able to, to maintain the life in Earth during millions of years. Only the problem is now when we arrive and we change the, the way we use the energy. Uh, the problem is if the sun has been um, enough to sustain the life and now we cannot sustain the kind of society we have in our planet, the problem is with our society not with the energy, not with the, or the, the war of the energy. So there are infinite small solutions. You fix one little problem here, one little problem there, and life is better. You think globally, you act locally. This is very important, because otherwise you give the impression of people that this is United Nations, presidents, scientists, and they don't have to do anything. That they will fix the problem. But people have to start from scratch and start to do small things, baby steps. Crisis or changes or problems can trigger uh, many of these things, that these are a sustainable alternative, whatever it's called, but it's basically adapting. We are adapting to changes, and that's the success of the human beings. What we must know is that the world is changing, and we must change um, the, the way we uh, saw the world. And one of the things we need is more friendship, more love, because we have also only one world. The world is only one. 
and it's for all of us. Te doy mi pan, te doy mi paz, te doy mi Dios, te doy mi sal. I think we can learn a lot from each other and reflect more on how to be happy with less and how you really don't need that much, uh, you know, to, to be happy. I think that that's a challenge, a world challenge. Cuba has modest uh, experience that, you know, maybe some other people could learn from. And I think it will be a time for sharing, a time for cooperation, and a time for more solidarity and for working together. I think maybe we'll have a better world.